First of all, thank you very much for um, inviting me to speak and congratulations in making it this far, um, I should say, for the final paper. Um, and what I'm presenting today is part of my larger project that looks at the politics of uh, Bible translation and especially um, the King James Version and the Stadtvertaling. So for this conference, I've delved earlier to look at the Anglo-Dutch dimension of earlier Bible translation. Um, and today I will look at three kind of broad examples that show a little bit more about the importance of transnationalism when studying Anglo-Dutch relations um, in the early modern period. Um, and what is at the heart here is a kind of tension, and I would be quite interested to hear the medieval um, angle on this, is a tension between um, the international aspects of this production, um, while at the same time presenting it as a very important national endeavor. Um, and that will be very interesting. Um, so um, the story of early modern Bible production is a European wide one, marked by intertextuality, material exchange and opportunism. The urgency and great learnedness of Bible translations have been rich fields of study and debate. This paper turns attention to the means by which different translations were presented, including supposedly merely decorative elements, the political influence of grand national Bible projects, and the shared context within which translators and printers worked. One mechanism is through the woodcuts and copper engravings used for frontispieces and inset illustrations. So we're mostly be looking at frontispieces today. So frequently the same images were reused in different editions, traveling between production centers and recurring in the most influential national works of the period. Some of these images are an exchange of imagery or form. So it's an idea of a figure or an allegory, biblical narrative that emerges seemingly spontaneously in a variety of texts. So here we see the example of the allegorized figure of religion who appears on the title page of the Flemish painter and engraver Martin de Vos in a broadsheet. Uh, that broadsheet is published in a variety of languages, but I chose the um, Dutch version here. Um, and then she suddenly appears on basis Iconus of 1580, and then she appears on James I, the work. So suddenly there is this idea of an allegorized religion marking several texts in different languages, but within similar contexts. In other cases, the exchange is of a more concrete nature, and we've seen some of those examples earlier today. So that is the reuse or borrowing of the same woodcut or engraving in different works and often in different countries, um, which we'll see some examples later. In his comprehensive work on Netherlandish Bible illustration, Bart Rosier found several series of images that were reproduced for different Bible translations, both in the Netherlands and in England. Um, and Margaret Aston notes several examples where woodcuts from Bibles were repurposed in other genres, such as the ballad. So you suddenly see a, a woodcut that was used in the Dutch Bible appear on an English ballad. For several of these Bible frontispieces, the names of the engravers are known, which is unusual. And they were often by Dutch, including Flemish and German engravers, reinforcing the notion that these translations were not only by their content, but also by their production international. This paper takes as its example a particularly tightly knit triangle, and that is English and Danish authorized translations and Dutch unauthorized Bible translation. It is an increasingly well-researched perspective that Anglo-Dutch relations from the medieval period to the 17th century and beyond have profoundly influenced the literary, religious, and political landscape in a myriad of ways. If anything, that's what this conference has shown in wonderful ways. The networks that lie beneath these cultural expressions, um, consisting of travelers, printers, authors, artists, refugees, emigres, and so forth, form the thread that this talk follows. Follow is a very deliberate word I'm using here, since so many of their actors and systems were inherently mobile. Transnationalism insists that no national border is truly closed. In fact, that boundaries may be said to be constituted by the networks that cross and exceed them. To best capture this flow on a model larger than exchange between only two countries, I cheekily have decided to include Denmark. Um, so I hope you forgive me. Um, because I think Denmark and Germany were two indispensable part of the connections between England and the Low Countries. 
The examples chosen of a Danish, an English and a Dutch Bible edition exploited networks that stretched all over Northern Europe, leaving their traces at each station along the way. So we'll first go to Denmark. In the 16th and 17th century, several Scandinavian rulers released their own authorized version of the Bible, often with very little change to its content. Rather than claiming to revitalize a moribund translation, the key addition would be a personalized frontispiece with the current king or queen, mm -hmm. thereby cementing their association with regular Christian worship and, frontis and scholarship. These frontispieces were high value productions produced by often German artists of high standing and very rich in symbolic detail. In the Danish court, the issuing of a new translation became so commonplace that almost all monarchs did it. Um, and by doing that, the successive translations became less radical enterprises in themselves. Yet they became more potent symbols because the politico religious implications were more readily understood. The example shown here is Christian III's translation, which is the first full Danish translation from 1550. And this is a wonderful example of how this intertextuality of production works. So it gives a collage, oh, I'll just go back to more detail, um, of Old and New Testament images, including Moses bearing um, horns, my favorite mistranslation, um, which you can very nicely trace in this period and before. Um, and it was made by the German engraver Erhard Aldorfer. And here, before it became the frontispiece here to the Danish translation, it had featured on three other Bible translations, a German and Dutch and an English. It was originally commissioned for a Luther translation, which is the first complete low German Bible, 1533, then printed by Ludwig Dietz in Lübeck. It was consequently used for the English Matthew Bible of 1537, followed by an appearance on a Bible in Dutch printed by Hansken van Liesveld in Antwerp in 1538. The Liesveld printer is very famous, we'll visit in a bit. So this reuse of images in the period is well known, but because of gaps in the archival record is quite difficult to establish. This particular instant is an important find for several reasons. Firstly, it demonstrates that although these Bible projects portrayed themselves as important national projects, binding a monarch and their subjects, in actuality, they relied heavily on international networks of production. It was particularly important during the earlier decades of the Reformation, when ideals of vernacular translation were a pressing issue, but there was no money for it. Um, through the recycling of these images and frontispieces, costs could be reduced and they could rely on the skills of other countries and other artists. Though in some examples, the images were specifically commissioned, on other occasions, printers were free to select elements themselves. So relying on existing materials could make economic and practical sense. A second implication of this replication is that images cannot always be read as clear mirrors of the denominations and ambitions of the translation. Choices were certainly made, but it is important not to fall into simplifying either the process of production or the religious context in which these images were used. In this case, the images reuse in Danish, Dutch and English editions means that the artwork cannot be tied too closely to localized politics. Then we're moving across the channel to England. In 1568, uh, revised in 1572, the Bishop's Bible was published, um, which is often called the brainchild of Archbishop Matthew Parker. And it is a revision of the Great Bible. Its name derives from the group of bishops who worked on it, taking roughly three years to complete the translation. This is miraculously quick uh, for any translation. Um, the edition was not officially authorized by Elizabeth, so that's different to the Danish translations who were all authorized and um, also claimed to be by portraits on the frontispiece. Um, in the English version, authorized did not appear on the title page until the 1584 edition, but she is nonetheless present through a portrait and in a less bombastic manner to some of the earlier English translations, mostly Henry VIII's versions, the Bishop's Bible creates close connections between religion and rulership. 
So Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester, decorates the title page to part two, and part three begins with Psalms, containing a decorated letter of William Cecil. It is not known who made these, um, although some, such as the British Museum, have assigned them to the artists Franz Hogenberg or Remigius Hogenberg. Even though there is no certainty whether the two Flemish brothers did indeed make these two figures, we know Remigius was in the employ of Parker at the time, and no English artist of the period shows quite the same style. Um, and this is actually um, a really wonderful example of how civil matters encroach onto the sacred, because uh, you have two prominent people in um, in uh, Elizabethan period, politically very influential, suddenly coming into the text, literally becoming part of Psalms. All 124 woodcuts in the earlier um, editions have been taken wholesale from Luther Bibles printed by Sigmund Feyerbent and engraved by Virgil Solis of Nuremberg. They were removed from editions from 1572 onwards and replaced by bigger ones, uh, but fewer of them. These uh, woodblocks can be traced to um, text from the continent, such as several Catholic Bibles that use the exact same woodcuts. An example would be here, the Dutch um, Bible version by Nicolas van Bingen, which was published in Louvain in 1548. Although some were altered to suit Elizabethan Protestant taste, so in some of the examples, um, God is removed and you have a rather peculiar shaped sun instead. Um, in the corner, um, many of them remained unchanged. It is a clear example that prints were freely shared and produced amongst Catholics and Protestants throughout Northern Europe. Then we have our final example, a Dutch version. Dutch Bible translation has a more complex history than the monarchical editions we have seen so far from Denmark and England, where central operations of power and prestige can be discerned. Dutch and German contributors of woodcuts and engravings were an important cog in European Bible production, yet their home contexts were markedly different to these monopolizing efforts. Despite the tense religious climate into which Dutch Protestant translation was born on the Spanish occupation, 80 different Dutch language editions of parts of the Bible were released between 1522 and 1545, and between 1520 and 1566, 200,000 copies of Dutch biblical texts were produced. So these are huge volumes. This abundance was partly due to freedom from a single authorized translation, but it also reflects the rich printing culture in the Low Countries, their rising prosperity and their high levels of literacy. The first complete Dutch Protestant translation that you see here was printed in Antwerp and named after its printer publisher, Jacob van Liesveld. Van Liesveld printed many Catholic works, but also famously a selection of heterodox texts, despite several governmental edicts in the Low Country to hold such practices. In his lifetime, he produced six complete Bible editions and 12 partial texts. The Liesfeld Bible here was uh, based on the Luther Bible, for so far the letter was finished and the Vulgate. Some translations of individual books and the New Testament had already been printed at this point, but this was the first full translation in Dutch. It would remain the Protestant Bible for um, several decades um, until a group of emigrants goes to Emden, so that quite nicely links back to the Dutch uh, church archive, and there the De As Bible is uh, produced, which then kind of takes over. Um, here I've um, reproduced the frontispiece from the 1542 edition, partly because he used the same frontispiece on all of his editions, and it is also the last one before he was executed in 1545. Um, the woodcut frontispiece to the Liesfeld Bible was specifically commissioned for his translation, and it would be used consequently after this. The two chubby cherubs at the bottom are holding um, a shield with van Liesfeld's printing mark and initials. There is no trinity on this um, frontispiece, um, which is unusual because you often get the tetragrammaton at the top. Um, but by not including it, 
Um, this frontispiece could be used for both Catholic as well as Protestant editions. Instead, we have a horned Moses figure holding the Ten Commandments. We have four large male figures functioning as vertical pillars in the image, um, but they don't cl carry clear insignia of their identity, as is usually the case for saints or gospel writers. So um, I should have produced a picture as, as um, comparison to the King James version, where we do have very detailed saints and gospel writers, and it's very clear who is who. Um, here we're not quite sure. So um, uh, the exception, I would say, is a dour looking David in the right bottom corner um, who holds a harp. So that one is quite clear. The other ones um, hold Bible texts on large boards that may instead be um, used as means of identification with texts from Joshua, St. Mark and St. John. The fact that identification is in written form rather than visual has already been argued to show a clear reformed spirit in which the reader is encouraged to approach the text for themselves, so sola scriptura. It is a cautious and even ambiguous representation of the translation that follows. Though vernacular translation itself was not banned, extra textual material, such as glosses, prefaces, summaries, and frontispieces to some extent, of a reformed nature, um, and these could be explosive. This frontispiece is markedly neutral. It is moreover not of the same artistic quality as the state endorsed editions we've seen so far. The budget for this frontispiece was also considerably smaller because Van Diesveld had to pay for it himself rather than use national coffers for it. This Bible is the product of a time and place in the Low Countries that was confessionally disparate, politically volatile, and yet immense in its possibilities and production. So where here is the Anglo-Dutch dimension? Within the text, both testaments are decorated by images, which I reproduce some. I especially like the square arc, which um, appears in a lot of Bible translations of the period. Those of the Old Testament were based on Hans Sebald Beham's Biblische Historien from 1533, and the New Testament is based on Lieven de Witte's print for Dat Leven ons Heren. Beham's texts and illustrations are a really strong example of the networks that lie at the heart of Bible translation and the sheer volume of production in the early Reformation. So the Antwerp printer Simon Koch printed Dutch, Latin, and French translations with the same carefully copied images in 1535 and an English translation with the same images in 1536. So these images could be used in very similar contexts, um, which says something about how close these relationships were at the time. What these editions reveal, these three examples I've shown, is a complex network of production that stretched over the Low Countries, the German states, England, and into Denmark, where engravings, woodcuts, and frontispieces had multiple lives in multiple confessional contexts. A brief overview of just a handful of Bible title pages, such as this talk has attempted, reveals a circulatory system of ideas, skills, and material behind both authorized and non-authorized translation. Though material exchange was prioritized here, the processes of the translations themselves too show transnational cooperations of scholar, artists, theologians, printers, and publishers. Despite the nationalist pretensions of some of the editions, they emerged physically and intellectual from a densely connected Protestant cultural network for which our retrospective scholarship must lean on transnational perspective and methods. Thank you very much.